It's great to be here in the greatest city and civilization. Um, <coughs> It's true, other people have said it, so it must be true. If we said it, it would be bragging. God would take it away tomorrow. But um, this is, it's just fabulous to be here and to be here at this conference. Um, I'm a pollster. I study the opinions of people, kind of on the surface, and I peel away the onion and I get down to attitudes that are a little more stronger form in our brain, and then deeper down are the values that motivate us in our life. What is the good life? What is my life all about? Uh, what are we here? What are we humans here on this planet uh, for? Um, and the reason I study that is that we used to have the Judeo-Christian code, and that was sort of what it was all about. And once we learned that, our values were set for the rest of our life. But those got questioned in a, in a diverse uh, country, in a diverse world, um, where we questioned religious and patriarchal and other authorities. But we have to kind of figure out what people values are in order to help as researchers in consumer marketing, helping people sell stuff to us, and in social marketing, helping us people who want us to move uh, civilization in a good direction. And I guess I'm here today with my colleagues because uh, Canada is a democracy, uh, and apparently British Columbia is as well, or at least forms of democracy, and that means that um, we cannot decide these policies of carbon tax and cap and trade and emissions trading and all that uh, just for the vote of people in this room. We actually have to get outside the room and engage uh, a lot of other people. And I think a lot of other people in Canada probably feel a bit like me at this conference, like we're high school students at a meeting of economists and we're kind of scratching our head thinking, oh my God, what are these people talking about? Uh, my world looks pretty good, actually. They're talking about the end of the world. And uh, so, should I get out of bed tomorrow? Or should I, you know, maybe, what what should I do? Because um, if you get too much bad news, essentially you just give up. Um, too much good news is also not, you know, people live in a fool's paradise. So, um, I am uh, passionately, um, as an author and as a bolster, interested in Canada's socio-cultural dynamics, the French and the English, the Catholics, the Protestants, multiculturalism, and, and more lately the Aboriginal story. And actually, when I look at that Canada, the Canada of these diverse people, I see a you know, pretty good story. So I'm kind of a glass half full guy. But then I come to a conference like this, and I just kind of wonder, my God, how are all these people doing so well together, compromising, finding creative solutions? And then we have this monumental issue where we seem to be well, almost stupid or stupid and hypocritical or whatever. So if there's a disconnect for me when I come and, and, and I'm in, in, a, in a conference like this. It's like when I go to a, an economics conference in Toronto at the Rotten School and they're telling me someone can't a basket case, we have the most productivity everywhere. Uh, we compare Ontario to Mississippi and Mississippi is twice as good as Toronto. And I think, well, you know, I live in Toronto and it actually feels a bit better than Mississippi the last time I was there. <laughs> So I'm, I'm kind of wondering, you know, what are the indicators? What's going? What's really going on? So I'm trying to understand the, uh, you know, the perspectives of ordinary people. Um, what we do when we dig deeper into values, we're trying to help people achieve their objectives. And one of the ways we do that is understanding values, and uh, and then uh, of the of the people who actually sort of agree with us, the poor, the people who already buy our products. And then we look at the values of other people and other people, and we try to build bridges uh, and connections to find deeper ways of connecting uh, people to other uh, uh, to other people to build a majority or, or plurality or majority coalitions. So the, the conventional social change method is to define a problem, uh, identify a technical policy to fix the problem, like the carbon tax, sell the technical policy to the to the elites and then hope we can sell it to the public, implement, and then defend those policies, and hope rationality prevails. And it would appear that the process you went through with the carbon tax is sort of that process. But if you use a values roadmap method, you define the base supporters and the opponents, you identify constituents of opportunity, you identify shared or bridge values, uh, then you craft strategic initiatives to strengthen bridge values, 
and then you build support on an issue, and then of course you measure that uh, over time. You have a feedback loop. You find out what was working, what was not working, and, and then you, you change course. That's the kind of another approach to uh, to building coalitions. So you you do that, then you have so then you have a, a plan, a roadmap. Um, you need communication strategy. You need framing. Um, you need to uh, and, and you need um, and you need an evaluation. So. Probably heard about framing. Like how do you how do you frame things so that people can understand what you're talking about in language that they understand? I'll give you an example of frames in our culture. Take abortion. There's pro-life and then there's pro-choice. It's a frame. Uh, guns. Uh, bad people kill people. Or another frame is guns kill people. Welfare perpetuates uh, dependence in one frame, or it's a hand up for a second chance in another frame. Smoking. Is real cool in one frame. That was the frame that I grew up with when I went to high school. Or it's really stupid. It's the frame that my daughter and her friends grew up in. Massive change in the frame on that subject. Uh, Same-sex marriage undermines the family. I know it's it's, uh, it's equality and dignity. Uh, one of my favorites is child care. Uh, it's it's either daycare, which is means that mom and dad are good parents, right? They have to give a the job over to somebody else, or it's early childhood education. It's helping your little genius actually conquer the world. So how are you going to frame that if you're a politician selling it? But what I love in Canada is tar sands and then um, oil sands. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting. In fact, yeah. the frame, if you've gone back 20 years and said, what was the discourse on the tar sands? It was, the question was, what does the price of oil have to be before it's economic? If you were in the box, if you were, if we had such a thing, and that's what it did the talk. Over time, what happens is you start to see in the box, if somebody mentions uh, water, and then somebody mentions aboriginals, and somebody mentions uh, greenhouse gas, the conversation evolves. Um, and I think we have to understand that as well when we're talking about this. How is the conversation evolving? So um, I must say, sitting here, um, over the last couple of days, I've been astounded at the absence of any reference to public opinion polling and market research. Well, the Premier, on his road to Damascus, decided that uh, there should be a carbon tax. I don't know whether it was the Holy Ghost or whoever, but anyway, that was what was going to happen. Um, I don't know whether there was research that he did. I don't know who's with me, who's against me, or whatever. Um, the green shift, I don't know where Stefan Dion came, maybe he was at the same Holy Ghost talking to him about how he should do this. But it, it, it's, uh, it was remarkable to me that this has sort of been kind of an extra fever. The king gets an inspiration, and I guess that's what's going to happen. Um, at any rate, um, I, I am kind of astounded. Uh, the deputy minister was here the other night and was asked questions, but there's no reference to to what, what the people thought, or the constituencies out there, or how they were being engaged in this conversation about what we're trying to do in British Columbia. Being a pollster, of course, I commissioned a poll last night, and I'm going to announce it today. I'm sorry, I've got some good news for you. Is good news okay? Uh, support for the British Columbia uh, carbon tax has increased 10 points since the election. And it's not just pre increased here, it's increased across the country. Okay? Uh, when Ryan Mulroney gave us the GST, and I handed it over to your buddy Kim to then go into the election with it, uh, it destroyed a political party. Uh, however that thing was born, and however it was sold, they went into an election, and they weren't annihilated. They were re-elected either because of or in spite of, I think actually probably because of, because I think in fact, he showed that he was on good moral uh, rectitude. He was on he, people, he was on the right side of the issue. And if the Democrats, for cynical reasons, said no, well then for strategic reasons, tactical reasons, they lost their moral authority. That's not a good thing to do, especially if you're a new Democrat who are morally superior to other people on the planet. So, you know, a lot is going on in the culture and in the conversation. And moral authority is very important. So the numbers have gone up. There are some lessons here, I think. This thing succeeded without broad public engagement. It was the old politics, right? Of, I think it's right, vote up or down. 
I think we in this room want to be part of the new politics. I think we've seen Obama. I think we've seen uh, 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 people get engaged in things that we never thought even existed or were not even voters before. I'm proposing that when a new election is held in Canada, that we have a royal commission, a postmodern royal commission, in which we actually have a national conversation about this issue. And this will not be a bunch of experts like we did with the Royal Commission on uh, the Royal Commission on the Future of Canada that gave us free trade. That was the intellectual basis for our having a debate on free trade and an election on free trade. It wants to go across the country with another Royal Commission and to be postmodern. What does that mean? Old media and new media. We will engage Aboriginal Canadians in this conversation. We will engage new Canadians in this conversation. We will engage multicultural Canada in this conversation. And what are we going to use? We're going to use new media. We're going to understand that the internet, there are millions and millions of conversations going on out there. There are blogs. There is uh, Facebook. There's MySpace. Uh, there's Twitter. My friend Naomi over here. There is an incredible number of people in this country who want to be part of creating the solution. They love Canada. They want Canada not to be the laughing stock of the world. They want Canada to be admired in this world today. There's an incredible amount of idealism in this generation. In the past, we had Encyclopedia Britannica. We asked the smartest guy in the world to write that little citation for what that was. Today, that guy does the draft, and a thousand other people have a wiki, and they correct them. And they change it over time because things change and we get to new knowledge. We must move to another way of engaging Canadians, evolving a consensus, and then, let's have that national election. Let somebody get 40% of the pocket vote and so on and give us a national policy. Let's Canada, if we built that railroad, this would be the vision for our future in dealing with undoubtedly the most important threat to our planet. Thank you very much. What's the error bar on the 10-point increase, and how big was your sound? This is our sample of 2,000 Canadians. It's the Environment Environmental Barometer. I imagine what proportion of that would be very strong, three or 400 people. Uh, we've been tracking this for a very long time, and uh, yeah, plus or minus 2%. But actually, when I speak, there is no margin for it. <laughs> <laughs> My interpretations are 100% correct. Uh, you want that data, then you get in touch with me, and I'll let you have it. But the, the, the real data is not this polling, it's those constituencies. And we looked at, um, and I didn't have time to really tell you about it, but when we segment people on environmental pricing reform, we find, I don't know, probably six segments, Steve will understand. So we got the struggling traditionalists, these are people we've got to take care of. The disconnected civics, anybody know any of them? Uh, we have the pro-market enthusiasts, right? These are all proportions. Brave new youth, anybody met any of these? Adaptive interventionists and responsible citizens. When we build our coalition behind these brainy ideas that the economists and policy wants come up with, we've got to engage these people. Now, we've certainly got to get to the point where we have enough where we can win elections. Who are they? What are their values? What are their demographics? Where are they? What media do we use to connect to them? People on this panel have been doing this as professionals all their lives. Um, we want to help. Yes? I was wondering if your sample about the carbon tax was it, does it, does it, uh, does it control for diversity uh, demographics? Uh, one of the reasons I'm asking about this is because I did try to raise this question yesterday about cultural, uh, cultural context of carbon, carbon policies, and it seems that not much thought has been given to it, and, they, and that's what always concerns me is about, is there any sort of, uh, sort of uh, policies or uh, research which sort of goes into seeing how different cultural groups is affected by, or how different cultural groups look at, uh, look at carbon policies. Yeah. 
we look at um, the, the classic way of looking at things is what do men think, what do women think, what a better income, higher income, lower income, better educated, lesser educated. And in my work that I've done in social values, I've actually found that the demography is not destined. You can get a 50-year-old uh, uh, people, a uh, man and a woman, and you'd say, well, they had a lot of the same background or the same age, they both had kids at the same time. They have absolutely different social values. And in fact, we have, our tribes are really not demographic tribes. Uh, you can't tell, actually, by looking at somebody's demography, what their values are and how they think and how they see the world. What you can do is find out what values they hold. And I found that there are, you know, among the baby boomers, we have the autonomous post-materialists, and we have the, uh, I mean, that's among Gen X, uh, autonomous rebels are the baby boom segment, and you got the disengaged armaments, and they're as different as day and night, and they can actually be products of the same family. Uh, you know, and some people say, well, you look at your daughter, or look at your son, I mean, did you drop him? <laughs> you know, so people can have actually radically different uh, points of view, but those are the things that inform them. And then they form, they connect with people who are in their, and I use the word tribe in the sense of social values tribe. So we are actually quite a complex culture when you look at just demographically. Add on to that the values overlay, and, um, and then it gets quite complicated, but then what you have to do is understand deep values that people have, and then bridge values. And then how do we speak to another person respectfully that says, okay, you and I are different on the surface, but underneath we are the same. And this is what we do, that well would tell us, this is what we do is we adaptively navigate through life. We're trying to figure out what is dangerous, and we're also trying to figure out and build coalitions of people who are like us. So that's the job of, of people who do the kind of work that I do, and I, unfortunately I have to leave, but uh, any quite further questions you have, uh, Steve Rosell here can answer them even better than I can, my old buddy, uh, because he does this kind of work, and of course Dan Yankel, which was, was the pioneer. We have a lot of very smart, creative people in this country, ask what you're for. Right? We should collectively be able to find people like ourselves, connect again through the new media. We don't have to wait for an op-ed in the Golden Man to be, you know, to be told what the truth is. We can self-organize. Uh, I'd like to see the government do this with its Royal Commission, but I think even without them, I think we can self-organize and we can be very, very powerful. Just as those very powerful self-organizing people uh, put a guy in the White House that nobody ever, you know, five years ago, are you crazy? So, glass is half full, uh, I think we can do it, because I've just seen the Canadians accomplish so much in this small little country. And uh, that if you look at the sociocultural resources, the gross national psychology or social psychology, I mean, you would you would then understand why this city is the city it is. And so, as we tackle this problem, let's use those human resources to solve this and form coalitions and, and win more elections. <laughs>